teach a New Testament survey course. This is a very condensed version of the course. So, you know, some, some parts of the New Testament I spend hours on, but I'm trying to keep each of these videos to roughly an hour. So starting with, with this first one, the gospel according to Matthew was probably addressed especially to Messianic Jewish believers in Jesus, probably after 70, although the arguments for the gospel's dates aren't conclusive. So I've argued for date after 70, I have friends who have argued for date before 70, I have friends who argue for date after 80, which is also after 70. But in any case, um, it may have gone through more than one stage, but I'm just giving samples here. I wrote a big commentary on Matthew for Urgens and a smaller one for university. But let's look at a major theme that, that runs through the Gospel of Matthew. So you have some books of the Bible, uh, some books of the New Testament, some other books from antiquity, where there's kind of a thesis statement up front. In the Gospel of Matthew, I think it's more the conclusion that pulls together some of the major themes. So we look at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and we learn about what we could call cross-cultural ministry, evangelism, and Christian education. You have one imperative surrounded by three subordinate participial clauses, or one command carried out in three ways. Some people would say two ways, but then the other thing is attached to it. So in any case, uh, it's one command, and there are three things involved in that command. Make disciples of all the nations is the command. You do that by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. Going, making disciples of all the nations. This isn't a new idea in Matthew's gospel. It's one that Matthew's been getting us ready for, for a while. So, the gospel opens with Jesus' ancestors. I know these pictures aren't all like Jesus' ancestors, but I took whatever I could get free from Microsoft PowerPoint Image Bank back when that was available. So ancient genealogies typically included only men. Please don't look at me that way. I'm just telling you the way it was back then. If it were me, I would include the women too. But anyway, Matthew includes four women. Who are they and where are they from? Well, you've got Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, but she's called here Uriah's widow, her that had been the wife of Uriah. Where are they from? Tamar was from Canaan. Rahab was from Canaan, specifically from Jericho. Ruth was from Moab, even though Deuteronomy 23.3 says, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the Lord's congregation of the 10th generation. Bathsheba was her that had been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So all four of them are either Gentiles or have Gentile associations. I think Bathsheba was from the tribe of Judah, but she had married into a Hittite family. Even though the purpose of Jewish genealogies was to highlight the purity of one's Israelite ancestry. Well, let's look at the three main characters or composite characters in Matthew chapter two, besides the characters that were already introduced in chapter one that we skipped, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Well, who are these three main characters? Well, you've got the Magi, Persian astrologers. You've got Herod, who's called King of the Jews, even though he's an Edomite, but uh, he ruled over the Jewish people. Scribes and aristocratic priests, kind of the pastors and seminary professors of their day, God often surprises us. The penalty for astrologers as a form of divination in scripture was death. But three times the narrative says that these magi came to worship the king of the Jews. Well, think about what Old Testament king killed male children. Pharaoh, right? And you've also got Antiochus Epiphanes doing some things like that. He was somebody um, in the Maccabean literature who also did nasty things. But <clears throat> people would certainly think of Pharaoh. And therefore, you have people who would be considered pagans by most of the Jewish people, worshiping Israel's king, and Herod, the king of Israel, 
acting like a pagan king. It subverts people's expectations in the narrative. But scariest of all to us should be the Bible teachers, especially for those of us who are Bible teachers, because scripture told the Magi where they could find this child. Of course, in Bethlehem. But the people who knew the Bible the best didn't go. And a generation later, their offspring wanted Jesus dead. This is a sin that only people who know the Bible can commit, taking it for granted instead of following it. Matthew chapters 3 and 4. Don't think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Chapter 4, he speaks of Jesus relocating to a place to fulfill what's written about Galilee of the Gentiles. So he keeps driving on this point about Gentiles. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, you have a Gentile centurion. And Jesus says, many will come from the east and the west will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. So again, we have people from far away, apparently Gentiles, and the centurion certainly was a, a Gentile. You've got Jesus curing apparently Gentile demoniacs, certainly in predominantly Gentile territory, as he casts demons into some pigs. This is, I don't know if I used this in the Mark video, but the expression deviled ham. Anyway, Chapter 10, he, he says that the towns in Galilee that reject him, to treat them like Sodom and Gomorrah. This is how the Old Testament prophets also spoke of their people when they were disobeying God's word. And again, in chapter 11, he compares them to Sodom. And in chapter 12, Nineveh and Sheba will be better prepared for judgment day than God's own people. And in chapter 15, you've got a Canaanite woman. Now in Mark, she's called Syrophoenician in Greek. She belongs to the elite ruling citizen class, taking the, the bread from the children's mouths. So there it may be more of a class issue, perhaps. But here it's clearly an ethnic issue. I mean, the displaced Canaanites settled in Phoenicia. So you can see why Matthew would want to highlight this aspect. But this isn't the first Canaanite woman in this gospel. Um, because you've got, remember, Rahab and Tamar. So uh, chapter 16, verse 13, this is where Jesus puts the question to his disciples, whom do you say that I am? And Peter confesses Jesus at this place, at Caesarea Philippi. But this was a pagan place known for pagan worship, the worship of Pan and known for witchcraft. Chapter 24, 14, the good news about God's kingdom must be preached among all peoples, and then the end will come. And in chapter 25, the nations will be judged by how they responded to Jesus' agents. There's debate about the exact meaning of that. I take that as Jesus' representatives who bring his message, the good news of the kingdom to the nations. But the, the point here is, that the nations are all judged by how they respond to Jesus' agents, or whoever you take those agents to be. <clears throat> so this theme of making disciples of nations, of, of going among nations, or reaching the nations as they come among you, Matthew's probably emphasizing this, as I said at the beginning, to a Messianic Jewish community. Jewish believers who have lost friends, and probably relatives in the massacre that that was taking place or had taken place in, in the Judean Roman War of 66 to 73. So they had good reason to hate Gentiles, especially the most hated Gentiles of the Old Testament Canaanites and the most hated Gentiles of their own period, like Romans, and perhaps especially people like Roman centurions or Roman soldiers. And yet Matthew is emphasizing through these accounts about Jesus, we are to reach everybody. Now today, whatever our ethnicity, whatever 
the ethnicities of people we might not particularly like in ourselves. God calls us to transcend those prejudices, to love everybody and to share the good news that God is bringing salvation into this world through Christ, to share that good news with everyone. Well, to, to all the nations, and then he says, baptizing them. Well, we have to go back earlier in Matthew's gospel to see what that was about. It's an act of repentance. John the Baptist was, was immersing people, uh, which was how they did baptism back then, although uh, we usually don't do it exactly the way they did back then. Back then it was normally done completely naked. Uh, however, probably co-ed baptism in the Jordan, probably they did have something on. So anyway, but, but John the Baptist was baptizing them. And this was the message that accompanied his baptism. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, baptism was used back then, well, there were a bunch of different kinds of ceremonial washings, but when you would wash Gentiles converting to Judaism, you would you would immerse them, you would you would baptize them as a as a way of washing away their Gentile impurities. Now, that once for all kind of baptism, John appears to be doing that here uh, for Jewish people, so treating everybody on the same terms, but calling them to repentance, to turn to God using the language of the, the Old Testament prophets and the idea of spiritual purity and spiritual purification, of course, is also in the Old Testament prophets where God would wash them with pure water in the time of restoration and pour out his spirit on them to, to restore them. So the one kind of baptism already mentioned in this gospel is, is John's baptism. And John actually functions as a model for discipleship. You look at his location in the wilderness, providing safety from society, fitting what the Old Testament prophets talked about, the new exodus, and also evincing a sacrificial lifestyle. No place to plug in your, your iPod in the wilderness. His wardrobe, he wore a leather girdle, which was reminiscent of the garb of Elijah, who was supposed to prepare for the day of the Lord. And of course, John comes as a new Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord, for Jesus. And again, his wardrobe signifies a sacrificial lifestyle. He doesn't have a very diverse wardrobe. Well, a lot of people back then didn't. But his diet, locusts and wild honey. Yes, he ate bugs, but locusts were kosher. They were one of the only kind of bugs you could actually eat, uh, that you were allowed to eat. So. There were other people who ate that, but usually it wasn't their exclusive diet, high on protein. But again, it, it signifies a sacrificial lifestyle. He's getting what's available in the wilderness. The wild honey, he could smoke the bees out of the hive, break open the hive. Some people think it was vegetable honey, but it could have been bee honey from wild bees. Break open the hive and scoop out the, the honey. But notice the message that goes with his baptism of repentance. Repent, that's why it's called the baptism of repentance. Repent to prepare for the coming kingdom. Well, notice what Jesus' message is. John's message in, in chapter three and verse two, Jesus' message in chapter four and verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 10 and verse seven, when Jesus sends out his disciples with their message, the kingdom of heaven is near. So what we see is, that there's a continuity with the message. You also have signs confirming or demonstrating the kingdom, demonstrating God's reign with Jesus' proclamation in chapter four, uh, following the summary message, repent for the kingdom. And before you have it, that fleshed out in terms of the ethics of the kingdom in chapters five through seven. And also signs confirming the kingdom with the disciples' proclamation in chapter 10 and verse eight. And then Jesus sends the disciples precisely to multiply his ministry of proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom. When I say demonstrating, healing the sick, delivering people from demonic forces, doing these things to demonstrate God's reign among people. Presumably the kingdom message continues to include demonstrations of God's power today as well, because we have this continuity. Uh, we will find uh, one thing that does get revoked in the Great Commission, 
that appears back in chapter 10. The only thing that's explicitly revoked in chapter 10, don't go in any ways of the, in any way of the Gentiles or to Samaritan towns. But obviously in chapter 28, that one is revoked. Go to Israel first, but now it's a message to everybody. <clears throat> so what has changed? Well, continuity suggests we should still be proclaiming this message. Turn to God and submit to the reign of God. Welcome the reign of God. There's now a new element. Now we proclaim more precisely who is king in God's kingdom. And that's why you know, John the Baptist's baptism involved the message of repentance. But the baptism that's mentioned in chapter 28, more specifically, goes beyond John's baptism of preparing for the kingdom by saying, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this climax in Matthew's gospel illustrates the character of God. Um, Jewish people acknowledged God as Father. They acknowledged the Spirit as divine, although thinking of the Spirit in terms of kind of a part or aspect of God. Putting the Son between the Father and the Spirit is tantamount to declaring Jesus' deity. He also says in verse 18 of chapter 28, Jesus has all authority in God's kingdom. Jesus, in other words, is king in the kingdom of God. Already back in chapter 9, Jesus said that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And that's an allusion back to Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man would have authority ultimately to reign forever. And throughout the gospel, Jesus demonstrates his authority over storms, sickness, spirits, and he invites his disciples to recognize that authority. But here, he's now recognized as exalted Lord over all of creation. It's also said that he's with us in our mission of making disciples of the nations. Jewish people understood that God was omnipresent and only God was omnipresent. Later rabbis called God makom, the place, meaning the omnipresent one. But this, again, is not something that Matthew is springing on his audience just at the end of his gospel, because already in chapter 1 and verse 23, he declares that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. <clears throat> and in chapter 18 and verse 20, he speaks of, of his presence among those gathered in his name, where two or three are gathered in my name, there is my presence among them. Well, there was a saying among Jewish people, it's attested a bit later, but it's very unlikely they got it from Jesus. Um, the saying was, where two or three are gathered for the study of the Torah, the, the, the scriptures, there is God's presence, his Shekinah, among them. Jesus is claiming to be the presence of God. So, well, so you're proclaiming this good news of the kingdom. You are baptizing people, uh, initiating people into the kingdom. And the context of this Great Commission gives us examples of how this proclamation should work. You've got a positive example in chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. The women proclaimed the resurrection truth despite the prejudice against their gender. Chapter 28, verses 11 to 15, we have a negative example of proclamation where the guards at the tomb lie out of fear and greed. And then, of course, we come to the, the Great Commission where we are to carry on the task, which was modeled positively by the women at the tomb and negatively by the guards at the tomb. So we've looked at going among all the nations. We've looked at baptizing, initiating people into the faith with the message of Christ. And now we turn to the other aspect of making disciples of the nations, and that's teaching them to obey Jesus as all that I've commanded you. Sometimes we talk about missions as Christians, but missions is not just evangelism. It's also training disciples who can partner in the task of evangelism. It's multiplying the work 
by trusting the Holy Spirit and Christ's teaching to multiply equally committed labors for the harvest. In some countries, such as my country in the US, to a great extent, we've lost an emphasis on teaching people solidly God's word. Most things in my country are driven by marketing. It's not against marketing, but some things, some messages market better than others. People love to hear about being new in Christ. That's good. We should talk about that. But when Jesus talks about take up your cross and follow me, that doesn't market so well. But marketability is not the same thing as truth. You want to market your truth well, but marketability is not tr truth. Message of suffering, message of standing firm during suffering, those aren't marketable messages, but people need to hear them. Calling the church back to God's word. You've got a lot of churches on the left that just follow the dictates of the culture. Actually, a lot of churches on the right follow the dictates of the culture too, just different dictates. But a lot of churches follow their denominational traditions. May God give us the courage to be different and go back and search the scriptures and see the message that God has for us there so we can pass that on to others. Again, our mission is not just evangelism. It's training disciples who become our partners in the task of evangelism. It's not a paternalistic task like, okay, you do what I say. It's like, hey, now we're brothers and sisters. We all share in this task together. The Great Commission is not something just tacked on to the end of Matthew's gospel. It summarizes the heart of this gospel's message. Will we heed it? Will we devote our lives to what Christ has commanded us? Now, each of us have different callings and gifts. And in a war like in World War II, it can involve total mobilization. Everybody's involved in the war effort. Some are making the weapons back home. Some are on the front lines. Now, I'm not talking here about a physical war. I'm talking about a spiritual war. But the spiritual war determines where people will spend eternity. The spiritual war impacts people's lives. It's a matter of life and death. And so it's worth devoting all of our resources to mobilizing God's people for Christ's commission to make disciples among all peoples. And that discipleship includes teaching Jesus' teachings, which include things like loving your neighbor as yourself. So they have you know, really massive implications. The stakes have never been so high. The world's population in 1830 was maybe a billion. By 1930, two billion. By 1950, three billion. Now somewhere around seven billion. In Czech, maybe more. But God's power will be commensurate with the task that he gives us. The stakes are highest now, but he will give us the power to do what he's called us to do. Matthew's five main discourse sections, the ethics of the kingdom, chapters five through seven, chapter 10, the proclamation of the kingdom, chapter 13, seven or eight parables, emphasizing especially the presence of the kingdom, that as the king has come, he's inaugurated his kingdom, but the king is yet to come when the kingdom will be consummated. So we work for justice and peace in the world. We work for people's uh, coming to know the true and living God. But some things just won't happen until Jesus comes back. So we work toward the works of the kingdom, but we also do that realistically, realizing that, yeah, we're not here to take over the world. We're here to serve the world and and serve people's needs and tell them about Jesus. And we still pray for God's kingdom to come. Um, yeah, little, little digression there, but chapter 13, parables of the, especially presence of the kingdom, like the mustard seed uh, that grows into a, a much larger plant. Chapter 18, relationships in the kingdom, how we go after the lost sheep, how we care for the little children, and sometimes how we have to discipline those who've wronged others, like those who wrong children. And also, it talks about forgiveness. Chapters 23 through 28 deal with the future kingdom and judgment on the religious establishment. 
Now, this is from the standpoint of, of Jesus' day. So he's speaking of things that happened in the year 70, and he's also speaking of things that are still to come uh, for, for us as well. Uh, and so he deals with judgment on the religious establishment of his day and probably judgment on the religious establishment of our day if we're not faithful and don't look out for the little ones, but just look out for being big or whatever. With such teachings, we make disciples for the kingdom's king. Matthew highlights Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament promises. Thus, you have a bunch of texts that say, it stands written, it was written, and it's to be obeyed, or it's being fulfilled, or Jesus is one of the fulfillments, depending on you know, which passage we're talking about. So often, it speaks of things being fulfilled, and how we're to, we're to fulfill, and how Jesus fulfilled scripture, and especially Jesus. So genealogies. Ancients usually kept a good track of their ancestors. In Roman period Egypt, ancestry could go back seven generations, and that could affect your taxation status, especially for those with significant ancestries. Like priests, you better keep your records. Uh, and also for somebody descended from the royal line. Well, we have uh, a later tradition that some of Jesus' relatives were hailed before Domitian because of their royal ancestry. So it makes sense that Jesus' family would have kept their genealogy fairly far back. Although uh, Luke and Matthew go about that a different way. But Matthew uses Jesus' genealogy to teach about Jesus' official lineage from the line of David. Now, the official royal lineage through Joseph was more important than his genetic lineage through Mary. Uh, adoption was regularly used for, for kings, regularly used for uh, especially most of the Caesars in this period were adopted by their predecessor as their son to carry on their mission. So if Jesus is Joseph's adopted son, well, that's the lineage that, that counts uh, for, for Matthew. But Matthew also gives us hints of Jesus' spiritual heritage at points. Rabbis often would use these, what we call midrashic word plays on scripture. And there's a, a couple places in this genealogy in Matthew chapter one, where Matthew kind of tweaks the wording or the spelling, I should say. So we have a few things. They're not in most of your translations. The translators probably thought it's the ancient equivalent of a typo. So we have a, a place where it names in Jesus' genealogy, the wicked king Amon. But it doesn't spell it Amon, it spells it Amos, with a side hint to the prophets, like Amos. We also have the king Asa, but Matthew adds one letter in Greek so that it turns into Esaph. Well, Esaph was the author of, one, of some of the Psalms. And so Matthew is giving Jesus royal ancestry, but with hints spiritually to his prophetic, uh, his, his um, grounding in the prophets and the Psalms. So three major sections of the Old Testament, Jesus embodies and fulfills the heritage of all that God had been doing among his people. It comes to this climax here. Now, the function of the genealogy, biblical genealogy sometimes summarized history between eras, uh, but most significant here is that the time has come. Genealogy is often skipped some generations. If you compare Matthew 1 with 2 Chronicles, you'll see that Matthew skips some generations. But he's trying to give you kind of a round figure, and so the figure he, he rounds to is a schematic 14. You have major events occurring at these major intervals, like David, like the exile. Well, it's been a long time, actually, technically more than 14 generations, but it's been a long time since this last major event in Israel's history. And so it was about time that the Messiah came on the scene. Same as John the Baptist is a new Elijah introducing the way for Jesus, Matthew is showing how, yes, this was the right time for Jesus to come. Matthew 1.1 introduces the book 
or at least introduces the, the list up front, the genealogy up front. As the book, a lot of translations say the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the book of the literally in Greek, um, Genesios, the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. That's the uh, Greek translation of Genesis 5.1. That's where Genesis gets its name in, in English uh, from the Greek name, which goes back to that. But usually when Genesis records genealogies, it, re it doesn't record your ancestors. It records your descendants because they, de they depend on you. But Matthew doesn't record Jesus' descendants. He records his ancestors turning it the other direction because ultimately all of this history was pointing towards Jesus. God brought all this to bear in history to point ultimately to the climax in Jesus. Son of Abraham, so he embodies the heritage of his people. And we're going to see that in some of the, the scriptures fulfilled if, if we have time to look at them. Uh, and also son of David, which is elsewhere in Matthew and in Psalms of Solomon, which was a, a Jewish work from the first century, probably the first century BC. And um, for Q for Legium um, uses, um, speaks of the son of David, who would be son of God. It's a messianic title. So Jesus is not just any descendant of David. He's the one, the promised one that the Jewish people were looking for. Now, what does Matthew mean by fulfillment? Sometimes we're talking about direct prophecies. Sometimes we're talking about analogies that fit God's way of working in history. So I'm going to skip to one of the latter. The, the former are kind of straightforward, but one of the latter. Matthew has a number of these. One of them is Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. Out of Egypt I called my son. Well, this is from Hosea 11, 1, where you've got two parallel lines. When Israel was young, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So in light of Hebrew parallelism, the second line repeating or developing the first, it's not about the Messiah per se. It's about Israel when God brought them out of Egypt in the time of the Exodus. Is Matthew ignoring the context? But Matthew, unlike the Septuagint, seems to, he makes his own translation of Hebrew. Probably he does know the context. And he also knows the rest of the context because Hosea 11 goes on to promise a new exodus, a new era of salvation. So Matthew finds a pattern between Jesus and Israel's history here. And this isn't just a guess. Matthew consistently follows this pattern in his first few chapters. You've got Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, although that also evokes Moses fasting for 40 days. Israel was tested in the wilderness. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. God gives Israel commands in Deuteronomy. Jesus, when he's tested in the wilderness, quotes three of these commands from Deuteronomy. And actually, in all in the same section, so in light of the context, Rachel weeps over Israel during their exile. Rachel weeps over Israel uh, when the, the children of Bethlehem are, are slaughtered. And you even find in the Old Testament itself, uh, in Isaiah, a connection between the people of God and the leader who represents the people of God before God, and they suffer on, on their behalf, which is a theme that was also developed in um, Second Maccabees and Fourth Maccabees and so on about martyrs atoning for their people by their suffering and so on. So this was something that, that could have been understood and that Matthew seems to take for granted that his audience will understand it. In Isaiah 42 to 44, the servant is explicitly Israel, God's chosen. Chapter 42, verse 18, though, says that God's servant is blind and deaf. And in Isaiah 49, 3, again, Israel is God's servant. But in Israel 49, 5, God's servant is one to bring Israel back to him. And you also have that in Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. Israel fails in its servant mission, just like 
pretty much everybody in the world has failed. So a righteous one within Israel fulfills that mission on behalf of his people and as Matthew emphasizes to us, on behalf of all of humanity. So Matthew 4.17, the kingdom of heaven, that's central in Jesus' teaching in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, in Mark and Luke, this is called the kingdom of God. Usually in Matthew, it's called kingdom of heaven, which was a respectful title for God. Well, what does kingdom usually mean? That can confuse us in English, but in Greek and Hebrew, it usually means especially reign, or rule, or authority. And Jewish people were longing for the day when God would reign unchallenged over the earth. So we have a, an ancient Jewish prayer that goes like this. And the, oh, I need to change this slide. I'm sorry, uh, but I don't have the technological know-how to do it quite at the moment while I'm giving this lecture. Um, our Father in heaven belongs to some other Jewish prayers, not to the Kaddish. But anyway, exalted and hallowed be your great and glorious name. May your kingdom come speedily and soon. If that sounds familiar, Jesus adapted something familiar. It already was scripture-based. But the kingdom for believers in Jesus is both already and not yet. Because we believe that the king has come, but the king also is yet to come. So we speak of the kingdom being in two stages. The Messiah comes twice. Jesus arose. The future resurrection that we are awaiting has already invaded history. The first fruits of the resurrection is, is Jesus, the firstborn from the dead. That's why the New Testament elsewhere says that Jesus has delivered us from this present evil age. It's not always translated this way. I don't know why the translations do this. Um, this is the Greek word ion, which normally means age. And they translate it as if it's cosmos, which means world. Sometimes they overlap, but I wish they'd be more consistent here. Don't conform to this age, Romans 12, 2. Hebrews 6, we've tasted of the powers of the coming age. Ephesians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 5. The spirit is the down payment of the future kingdom. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10, we experience a foretaste of the future by the spirit. Uh, Romans 8 says that we have the, the first fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and of course, the Spirit was promised in the Old Testament prophets, an outpouring for the time of the kingdom, the time of the restoration. So looking at Matthew 5 through 7, and I know I'm talking quickly, but you can always slow down the video. If I slow down my talking, the video will be too long. So the ethics of the kingdom, chapters 5 through 7. You've heard it said, but I say to you. So in other words, here's something that you've heard. And in all but one of these cases, it's just exactly scripture. One of the cases, it's scripture slightly modified. But Jesus is giving a madrashic exposition of it. He's saying it doesn't just mean this. If you really want to follow God's heart, you have to want to keep it. And that addresses something deeper. So anger and murder, adultery and lust, adultery and breaking up your marriage and, and so forth. So here's just a sample of some of the things he talks about. Um, not, the, not the smallest stroke of the law will pass away, he says. In other words, all of God's word is forever. Now, when he says the smallest letter or the smallest stroke, he's probably alluding uh, to something that his audience was familiar with. There was a story about the smallest Hebrew letter, the Yod, where God took a Yod from Sarai's name in Genesis 17, and her name becomes Sarah, which is how most of us know her name most often. But this Yod, it said, cried out to God from one generation to another, saying, God, you've taken me out of the Torah. You've disgraced me. When are you going to put me back in your word? And God, uh, but by the way, how many of you think this is a true story? Okay, it's not meant to be a true story, but it's meant to make a point. Well, later on in Numbers chapter 13, 
Hoshea's name is changed to Joshua, literally Yehoshua in Hebrew. He gets a yod stuck in his name. And so the rabbi said, you see, not a single yod can pass from God's word. They had another story like this, that the yod was crying out to God. God, King Solomon is trying to uproot me from the Bible. Don't let me be disgraced. And God said, a thousand Solomon shall be uprooted, but not a single yod will pass from my word. So Jesus is making a very graphic illustration that people may have understood. So we could go on with this, but to take an example of Jesus' teachings in Matthew, specifically related to discipleship, since it concludes by talking about making disciples of the nations. Well, how do we make disciples for the kingdom's king? Teachings about discipleship in Matthew's gospel. Jesus is above job security. Mark chapter one, Matthew chapter four. He calls fishermen as disciples. Jesus is above residential security. Foxes have nests, uh, sorry, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but Jesus has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is also above financial security. He says to the, to the uh, rich and ruler, give everything to the poor, Matthew 19. Jesus is above social obligations. Let the dead bury their dead. Now, you would be an outcast from your village for the rest of your life if you refused to see to your father's burial. I mean, that was like one of the greatest of filial obligations. And your filial obligations were among the greatest because uh, we have this both in the rabbis and in the first century, we have it in Josephus, the idea that many believed that honoring your father and mother was the greatest of the commandments. Jesus, of course, says it's loving God with all your heart, soul, and might, and loving your neighbor as yourself. One of the rabbis made that one the, the greatest, but a lot of them said, you know, honoring your father and mother is, is the greatest. Certainly it was very heavily emphasized. There, there are a couple explanations of this. One is it was a Semitic figure of speech. Um, wait until your father dies. Um, and then you know, after my father dies, then I can come follow you. There, there is evidence for that possibility. Another possibility is that it's referring to secondary burial because at, at this time, and not much of the rest of history, but at this time, what Jewish people would do, they would, in, um, they would put the person in the tomb and after a year, they would come back and they would put the bones in an ossuary, a bone box. It was as long as the longest bone in the body, the femur, uh, that's the uh, the big leg bone from your hip to your knee. So they put them in this in this bone box. That was the secondary burial a year later. So he might be asking for as much as a year's delay. But whether he's asking for a short stay or a long stay or asking for, hey, wait until my father dies, it's still placing Jesus above his parents, which was putting Jesus above necessary social obligations. But these are all examples that point to the ultimate example. Jesus is above life itself. If you wanna be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Mark has that in Mark 8. Matthew has it in chapter 10 and again in chapter 16. Now, each of these gospels, each of the gospels qualify these teachings with narrative. It's an absolute standard but it's implemented with grace. So the disciples were supposed to pick up their cross and follow Jesus. They didn't. They all abandoned him and fled, Matthew 26, Mark 14. But Romans drafted a bystander, Simon of Cyrene, to carry Jesus' cross. And yet Jesus never repudiated the disciples. He welcomed them back and patiently formed them into what he'd called them to be. God doesn't lower the standard to where we want to be. But he also shows us grace and that here's what he's called us to. He patiently forms us into that. We, we can grow into that as we go through the smaller tests, it helps make us ready for the bigger ones. And when the time comes that we need to lay our lives down for Jesus, well, 
we've had plenty of practice along the way of following Jesus. So we won't mess up like his first disciples did. Now, I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead, but to make my presentation of Matthew all in about an hour, um, again, my commentary is like much larger, like a thousand pages, but um, Matthew 23 through 25. It wouldn't be a survey course if I taught the whole thing. So Matthew 23 to 25, Jesus is not only a sage, but a prophet. He says, all this will come upon this generation, 2336. And then says, look, your house has left you desolate. Well, what house is he talking about in that generation? Context settles which house he's talking about and when. He's lamenting over Jerusalem in chapter 23, verse 37. And then he says its house is left desolate. He specifically promises the temple's destruction in the following verses. Very, very sadly. And here just remains from some of the stones thrown down in year 70. The disciples then ask him two questions. This is uh, clear and crisper in Matthew. One of the reasons I think, although not everybody agrees, I think that Matthew wrote after 70. So the disciples ask two questions. First, when will these things take place? What does he mean by these things? Well, they're responding to his statement that not one stone will be left on another, judgment in the temple. So when will these things take place? When the temple is destroyed. And the other question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus is answering two questions in the following context, and we need to keep that in mind. They, they're interwoven somewhat, but not, you know, Mark interweaves them more. I think Matthew, with the benefit of hindsight, is able to distinguish some between, between these. But again, not everybody agrees. His discourse addresses both questions, the temple's destruction. He speaks of the abomination that brings about desolation in the holy place. And that fits what he's just said in chapter 23 about your house has left you desolate. He talks about fleeing to the mountains of Judea. And he talks about these things being fulfilled within a generation, which everywhere else in Matthew's gospel is the generation then living and normally refers to something like around 40 years. But in terms of signs of the end, they want to know signs of the end. Jesus starts by giving some non-signs. And then he lists prerequisites for the end, one of which, of course, is the temple's destruction we just mentioned. And finally, the only sign that must immediately proceed, and that's Jesus' sign in the heavens. If you wait for that sign, Jesus is saying, you will have waited too late. So the temple's destruction. Your house will be left to be desolate in this generation. And then he speaks of a desecration of the temple that will lead to its desolation. The temple was destroyed in a generation. Exactly, if you think Jesus was crucified in 30, it's actually a little bit less if you think he was crucified in a little bit later in 33. But exactly, or pretty close to, 40 years after Jesus predicted it. Now, this wasn't a new thing. This had happened before when Israel had sinned. God allowed the temple's destruction or desecration. It happened under the Babylonians. It happened under Antiochus Epiphanes. And it happened in the year 70 under the Romans. And you know, sort of happened under Pompeii, desecration, and not the, not the city Pompeii, the general Pompeii in the first century BC. It happened in the second century under Hadrian, and we could go on. But anyway, in this context, Jesus says to flee when you see the desecration that will lead to destruction. So at the end of 23, he spoke of the blood of Abel and Zechariah, Zechariah's blood shed in the temple, and how these, um, the killing of these innocent people invited judgment. In the year 66, the Jewish, a lot of the young nationalists went in and slaughtered the priests in the temple. Josephus thinks this is the abomination that was going to bring about desolation a few years later, um, three and a half years later, to be more precise. 
Jesus says, when you see this, flee immediately. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jerusalem was in the hill country, and this was a strategic place to flee. And David was able to flee from Saul there. The Maccabees conducted guerrilla warfare from the mountains. Jesus was very emphatic about haste. If you're on the roof, they had flat roofs. Normally there'd be a stone staircase outside. Sometimes people had ladders, but more often a stone staircase outside. If you're on the roof, drying your vegetables or praying or doing some of the other things people did on roofs, uh, eating, eating dinner, don't go into the house. You go out the stone staircase, the ladder, and you flee. Don't, don't go back inside the house. That means it's really hasty. You better really hurry. Uh, if your cloak is at the edge of the field, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you recite your prayers, uh, sunlight, you, you go out uh, to your field and start working your field while you're still wearing your, your outer garment, which for the poor functioned as their blanket at night. You need that. Are you going to be cold at night? It was the one thing that the, the law of Moses said that a creditor cannot seize from a debtor overnight because they need it to sleep in. But here, Jesus says, if you left it at the edge of the field as the day has gotten warmer, don't go back and get it. Better to be cold at night than dead. So he's really talking about haste. Refugees have to flee quickly. Um, one of the pictures here is of my, of my wife, who was a refugee for 18 months. Uh, and this was her between the first time she was a refugee and the 18 month refugee period. And another of these is of my brother-in-law pushing my father-in-law in a wheelbarrow as they did during the war, although the scene was reenacted afterwards. Jesus says, pray that your flight won't take place in winter. Winter was so difficult to travel, even armies rested. It would be dangerous, especially in the sometimes snowy Judean hills. Also rivers flooded during winter, rainy season and became hard to cross. In fact, the Romans captured and slaughtered a large group of refugees trapped at the overflowing Jordan, um, not during winter in this case, but in the, in the spring, it was still overflowing. Haste really was important. The immediacy idea may be hyperbole, it may be rhetorical overstatement, that's pretty common in Jesus' teachings, but Jesus certainly intended swiftness. After the spring of 68, refugees couldn't even surrender to the Romans, even if they could get past the revolutionaries controlling the walls. Word got around among the Syrian auxiliaries who were working for the Romans that some of the Jerusalemites and other Judeans uh, within the walls of Jerusalem during the siege, some of them who were escaping had decided to make a living for themselves when they get out by swallowing some jewels that they could then recover when they would have their next bowel movement. It's a really painful idea to me. But anyway, um, these Syrian recruits said, hey, maybe, maybe we can get some more money. And so when, after this Judean fugitives fled to them, they would hold them down. Josephus says, uh, Josephus being a first century Jewish historian who was there, they would hold them down, cut them open and see if they had any jewels or precious stones inside of them. But in accordance with Jesus' warning, the Jewish believers had, uh, and Jesus had already fled. Now, besides the events fulfilled in the year 70, Jesus also gives some non-signs of the end. Prophecy teachers of Jesus' day said, here are things you're going to see in the time of the end. False prophets, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, apostasy, and so on. Jesus said, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. All these are just the beginning of birth pangs. Now, some people say it may get more intense toward the end, whatever, but these were things prophecy teachers were saying. You see these things, you know the end is at hand. Jesus specifically says these are not the signs of the end. Not that they won't be happening at the end, but they happened all through history. So whether they get more intense or not, um, he does list one prerequisite that is a sign of the end. 
For some things he says the end is still to come. But then in 2414, he says, this good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. If you like this composite picture here of Jesus coming back on the, uh, on the slides, uh, you notice my students who are so studious, they take their homework with them everywhere they go. Anyway, um, do you want Jesus to come back soon? Second Peter 3 says that God is patient, not wanting any to perish, and that we should be looking for and hastening the day of God. That is, we need to let people know the good news that God has the plan of salvation for them. This is